Selfsi, spoken easy language for social inclusion. Okay, my name is Ulla Boman, and I have been working with easy language in Sweden for more than 20 years. So I'm going to give you a presentation that contains parts of my experience. And um, some of the things will be repeated from what you've heard Tatiana and Laura has, uh, that they already have said. But I believe in repetition. Oh, finally. <laughs> okay. Uh, something else needs to be done. Okay. Uh, I used to work for the Swedish Center for Easy to Read, uh, but in 2018, I decided to start my own consultancy business. So what I do as a profession is that I rewrite lots of public information into easy language. I run training and workshop workshops on how to write easy to understand and I also give lots of presentations about the right to have access to information. So what I'm actually going to do is to share some of my experience, experience I have from working in Swedish using the English language to tell you about it, for you to apply in Latvian or whatever native tongue you have, uh, which is always a big, well, it is um, a challenge. Okay, uh, I have um, called my presentation Accessible Communication is Essential for Inclusion. And I feel that, well, that is not really an easy to understand title. And I feel that I want to give you some explanations to what I think about or how I interpret inclusion and also what communication is. Inclusion is a society for all. Everyone can participate. Everyone have equal rights. That is what inclusion is about. Inclusion is about human rights. And it's actually human rights and the respect of human rights that is the engine for me to work with easy language and accessible information. I also have a background of being the training officer for the Swedish section of Amnesty International, so therefore human rights is in my heart. Okay, there are still some problems with the... Okay. Well, a short commercial break? Okay. So if you need training in easy to read or easy language, contact me and I can come and organize a workshop for you. End of commercial break, hopefully. I said that human rights is the engine for me. Human rights is also about democracy. Democracy is crucial for a society where everyone's human rights are respected. And um, in a democracy, everyone should have a way of participate. And that is also why information and accessible information is so important. Inclusion is a society for all. 
and I said it has to do with democracy. And to build a strong and equal democracy, it's crucial that information is accessible. It's cru in, that is crucial for participation, for me to make choices, and also for me to speak up. So to me, accessible information is a human right, and to work with easy language is an important work to enhance human rights, to make you, more people to have access to their human rights. Okay, a few words about communication. You know, what is communication? I don't know if you are trained communicators, have you have, if you have been to school uh, to learn about communication, but you know, in communication there is a sender, right now it's me, there is a message, which is what I'm saying, and there are receivers, or one receiver, but here many receivers, that are you. That is the basics of communication. It is the process of um, passing information from one person to another. But accessible communication, what is that? Well, we've been talking earlier about equality here. And um, information and communication that is understood, that is accessible communication. And it can only be understood if I'm aware of uh, who is receiving the information. And if I look at that person as someone that is equal to me. Because otherwise I will not succeed in my communication as Laura and, and Tatiana also pointed out. It is about respect and it is about seeing each other as equals. When is the communication not accessible? Well, there might be lots of noises. Sometimes it's noises with the channel, like we had just recently, when the, the channel, the technique is not functioning the way it is supposed to. But there can be other noises, other obstacles that will stop the communication to be accessible. And I'm going to share some um, uh, examples about that. But first, you have to make sure you have to know that the channel you're using is a channel that works for your target group. And all of you on Zoom right now, uh, you realize that the channel being online was not a very reliable one today. The channel must work for your target group. And the target group is your conversation partner. And there are many different channels. And of course, if we're using the internet, if we're sending emails, uh, if you're reading the newspaper, if you're sending a, a regular letter, or if you're just reading information or listening to information on TV, radio, or the internet, it's very difficult to know if the receiver understands what you're saying. The most effective one, the, th the best kind of communication where you can really achieve accessible communication is when you and I can be in front of each other and we're talking back and forth when you see the, the person who is receiving the information. I'm sure all of you have experienced of misunderstandings, 
Sometimes a misunderstanding is something that you can just ignore. But very often, misunderstandings can have a big effect of the final result or the next step. It can be a misunderstanding if you're uh, filling out an application form for, your, uh, for child care, for example. If you fill it out wrong, you might not receive child care for your kid. Or you have to work, you get a letter back saying it was not correctly filled out. You have to add this information and it will prolong, it will take longer time before you get your, your application approved. When communication is not accessible, it can be that the information is not relevant or our frames of references are different or you're not showing the person you're communicating with respect, that there is no dialogue. I ignore completely the response for you. I just continue. I go on and go on and go on, not giving any attention to the, the response I get, for, I get from you. Or it could be the language itself, too many difficult or unknown words. This is also applicable. This is also regarding written language as well as spoken language. And today the topic is spoken language. I give, I'm going to give you some examples here. Information must be relevant. Um, do you have a robot vacuum cleaner at home? Or have you seen one? Uh, a famous Swedish comedian, he said that when he bought his robot vacuum cleaner, in the manual, the last instruction in the manual was, it's totally prohibited to put your pet on the vacuum cleaner, to put your dog or your guinea pig or, or your, your cat on the vacuum cleaner. But the fact that they added that information stole the entire attention from him regarding the other instructions because that was an idea he didn't have before. Hmm, maybe I should put my, my cat or my dog on the vacuum cleaner. So the information must be relevant because if we're giving information that is not relevant for this occasion, you might start focusing on that in your mind and you will not listen to the rest of what I'm saying. And relevant information is also, it can be too much or too little. You have to make sure that the information you're giving is relevant for this specific occasion. We use our frames of references when we interpret something that we do, it doesn't matter if it is a written text or it is when I'm talking with you. Have you read Donald Duck? Are you familiar with his nephews? His nephews are part, they are members of the local Boy Scout club. And here, Donald Duck, who is the scoutmaster, he says, well, bring a knife to the hike. And the nephew says, yes, uncle. But Donald Duck, he was thinking about this kind of knife that you use in the woods when you, when you need to get um, branches, etc., to start a fire. But the nephew was talking, was immediately thinking about the knife as part of cutlery, you know, the knife you use when you eat. We use our frames of references when we interpret things. You use your frames of references when you interpret what I'm saying right now. It is important when you're trying to make communication accessible 
that you're aware of what kinds of references the target group has. And a way of doing that is to give information about, okay, now we're going to talk about a Swedish pop band. That pop band's name is Kent. Because Kent could also be a parish in the UK. It can be Clark Kent, the Superman. It can be cigarettes, etc. Some people also say it's Barbie's husband, which is not correct, but it shows how our brain works. You know, Barbie's husband's name is Ken. And when we're not familiar with things, we kind of try to get them fit into the compartment here in the brain. So, Ken, it sounds like Ken, it must be Barbie's husband. I very often use the illustration of my older brother when I was growing up. Oh, he was, I could have sold him for a bag of candy. Uh, we did not get along. If I was doing a big jigsaw puzzle, you know, a thousand pieces, um, he would take one of the pieces and he would say, it fits here. Because if you slam it, of course any piece will fit anywhere. But that is actually how our brain works when it comes to frames of references. We try to fit in the information in our brain. And therefore, some of you might uh, say that Kent is Barbie's husband. Not sharing respect. Have you read any of the Moomin books by Tove Jansson. There is one story about the invisible child. And for those of you who have read it, you know it's about the girl Nini. And her mother is treating her very badly. The mother doesn't listen to what Nini is saying, uh, doesn't listen to her response, her emotions or anything. And gradually, Nini turns invisible. She doesn't dare to say anything. She doesn't dare to speak up. And that is actually what happens if we do not show each other respect. Eventually, you will not dare to say, I don't understand this. I need something else. So that is one reason why it is so important to show each other respect. Part of showing respect is to speak directly to people. I have a friend. He is a medical doctor. He's specialized in spinal injuries. He has started a very well-known institute for spinal injuries in Sweden. He is in a wheelchair after his own diving accident 40 years ago. So he's using a wheelchair. And still, if he goes to a men's clothing store and uh, needs a new shirt, and his wife is with him, the people in the store might ask his wife, what is his size? And Klaus is sitting there. I can speak, I can talk but the people in the store do not address him directly. That is not showing respect. And that is not to make information accessible. The best communication is dialogue. It is to show respect, it is to listen. And to make the person you're talking with feel that you're important. And it's okay to ask questions. So the dialogue will take away the noise. All of this has to do with written language as well as the verbal and nonverbal language. And Laura was talking about the 
the nonverbal language, which is part also in the guidelines. It has to do with the voice, the intonation, the facial expressions, and the body language. You know, it's a wonderful day for skiing. Yeah, and I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, it would be really nice to, to listen to the rest of the presentations during the afternoon. Yeah. Hmm. There is a big difference between what my mouth is saying and what my body is saying, and also the tone of my voice. To be accessible and easy to understand, body, mouth, and words, and face, they must say the same. Otherwise, you're not accessible. You might exercise power with your language. You can show that, <laughs> well, I know much more about this than what you do. I can also use words that only Tatiana and I know, and we can talk about that here, and you will be left out. That is not to be accessible. That is to exercise power. It is also to hide some facts or to put focus on something uh, that is not as important because you don't want the really important thing to be known. So we use the language, written or oral, verbal language, in all sorts of ways, but you have to be uh, cautious. You have to think about what is accessible and not accessible. The easy language use common and simple words, no expressions, it is concrete, it, like um, communication in Latvia is really bad. I mean the buses. Or do I mean that we are very bad at talking with each other? Or do I mean that the cell phone or internet signal goes down? Communication that are bad can mean all of this. In easy language, we make sure that it is concrete in a way that the uh, people we're communicating with understand what I mean. We use an active voice. Uh, there has been uh, uh, cuts in the budget has been done. Who did the budget cuts? And we also try to limit the information. I said that um, we can execute power using the language. I have here a, an example of a um, really tragic example from Sweden. Some years ago, I was asked to rewrite a brochure about uh, transportation services for people with disability. They wanted to have this brochure in EC Swedish. When I sent the easy language version to them, the municipality, the, the town, came back to me and said, oh no, we can't use this one. It is too clear who actually have the right to apply for transportation service, and our budget cannot take that. So, the municipality thought it was better to have this information in a difficult language, so not every single person understood if they could apply or not. That is to execute power, and that is not accessible communication. Words that can be really difficult to understand, right now they're talking a lot in Sweden about the army needs more power, okay? Better electricity? bigger mandate for decisions, or more weapons. You know, to, to have or to get more power can mean any of these three, and probably a couple of more things. We have to make sure that the person we are communicating with understand what's, understands what we mean. 
you have to have some knowledge about the target group. And the same word can have a different meaning depending on the age group or the culture group. I have one struggle with my kids. I have three kids. They're all born in the 1990s. In Swedish, we have started to use uh, the English term to back something up. To back something up is to support. But in Swedish, it used to mean to backa, is to take something back, to, to withdraw. The proposal uh, needs to be withdrawn and, and reworked on. So now we're actually using the expression backa in the terms of withdrawal or support. And then it is backa demokratin, back up the democracy or withdraw the democracy. You know, it is quite a big difference between those two interpretations. Finally, something about expressions. I'm sure you have lots of expressions in Latvian. Expressions is something you have to learn because they're not, it's not something that you immediately will understand by understanding each word. Uh, in English, when we, when we want to wish someone good luck, we say, break a leg. That is actually something really mean to say, right? I wish that your leg is broken. <laughs> in Swedish, we have an expression, there is no cow on the ice. It doesn't make sense in English at all. But it means, don't worry, it's not a problem. But how are you to understand that expression if you're not being taught that expression? So when you use easy language when you speak, avoid those, break a leg, or um, avoid. It's really important we are on the same page in this room. What page? Are we going to be in a book? Well, the guidelines, maybe. Are we going to be in the guidelines? The political language is very often very difficult. And, you know, the politicians have power. We're facing an economical winter, was one of the Swedish ministers saying a couple of weeks ago. I've also heard a Swedish minister say, it's not our ambition not to launch the program. <laughs> is, it our, is, there, is it their ambition or is it not? Are they going to launch the program or not? It is not our ambition not to do it. Or another minister said, all regions must step up. Step up? Very often the political language is difficult and therefore the Swedish adult education organization Vuxenskolan started a project some years ago. The project is called Mitt Val. Val means choice and election in Swedish. And it is a, but it is a project to enhance uh, well, to make more people with intellectual disability to participate in the elections and to, to participate in, in local politics and so on. And there are written materials and there are study circles. And when um, the project started, there was a survey um, People with intellectual disabilities were asked why they do not vote. And uh, one of the, some of the answers was, I don't understand the information. I don't understand the symbols, the, the political symbols, the, the symbols the different political parties have. Very often they are just communicate with the symbol and then what they want to do. 
I'm afraid to make a mistake and vote for a party I don't want to vote for, or I don't understand why I should vote. I don't understand if that has an impact. So therefore, uh, part of this project was to train politicians to speak easy language. Because they need to speak easy language, they need to be easy to understand. It has to do with democracy, because the, politi the politicians have so much power. One thing that was really interesting when I was running workshops for politicians last year was uh, I was running a, a workshop for local politicians for one of the political parties. I'm not going to tell you which one. Uh, I gave them some quotes from their official website and asked them to rephrase it. And I can tell you that 12 politicians I had around the table, they could not agree on what the quotes meant. The quotes were written in very difficult language, which you can interpret in so many different ways. And all of them around the table thought they interpreted the same way. But they had 10 different ways of rephrasing it in easy language. Maybe this is also a way of exercise power. Let's make the, uh, our platform, our political platform, so unclear, so you can decide how to interpret it. That is dangerous. Okay, we all have difficulties sometimes. But, do we speak up? Very often we don't. Some years ago, that um, the head of communication, and I'm saying the head of the communication in a big region in Sweden, contacted me and wanted an easy language summary on a report that the region had. And he sent me the report, I read through it, and I told him, sorry, I can't rewrite this in easy language because I don't understand what it is about. Then this person, the head of communication said, well, I don't understand it either. Um, I was hoping you would be able to help me with that. I guess I have to go back to the researcher and tell that person we need another report. So do we speak up? Very often we don't. And if there is one thing I want you to remember after this presentation is that I want you all to be like the little boy in the H.C. Anderson's old fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. The emperor, emperor, he's so full of himself, and uh, everyone around him is, um, well, I guess they're so afraid of him, so they don't dare to tell him that the new clothes are actually no clothes. This fantastic material does not exist. And it is a little boy when the emperor is walking down the main street showing up, showing off his fancy new clothes, the little boy says, he's naked. I want all of you to take with you to dare to say he's naked or to say, I don't understand. This is stupid. Let's make sure. In easy language, please. Thank you. Selsi, spoken easy language for social inclusion. Partners are Zavo Trisa, RTV Slovenia, Dyslexi Verbundet, Universita degli Studi di Trieste, Vieglas Valodas Agentura, Vilnius Universitetas, 
Vši informacijo skaupimo ir sklajdo s centras. Funded by the European Union.